Hi everyone, I'm Jim. I work for the Wyoming State Museum and today I'm going to be showing you another video or bringing you another video of an object that we maintain in the museum's storage facility. Uh, the object we're going to be looking at today was, it's a dangerous object that was a device easily found in about 10,000 shoe stores across the United States in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. In fact, in some cases all the way up into the 1960s. And the object that we're, we're examining today is called a simplex shoe fitting fluoroscope. And this is the one that the museum cares for. Now, as you can see, it's a good sized device. It has three viewing ports. There's one here, a little nose notch right there. Another one here with a nose notch. And then there's another one facing from the opposite direction that has the nose notch on the far side. There are two handles on this. This one was adjustable. There are two handles here. This could be slid up and down uh, based on the user's height. There are some dials and knobs and buttons on this side. And if we go over to this side of the device, you can see that there is a handle to hang on to right here just to steady yourself. Because to use this, you would have stood up on this black platform here, and you would have put your foot into this hole. But what is a shoe-fitting fluoroscope? And how was it used? Where was it used? And why was it dangerous? Well, the story for this all starts back in World War I. Uh, during the war, there was an American physician serving um, with the US Army in France. And his name was Dr. Jacob Lowe. And Dr. Lowe, one of the most common ailments that he saw uh, soldiers for were foot problems. And he reached a stage where he, was, he was, seemed to be spending a lot of time analyzing the problems that soldiers could, came to him about uh, concerning their feet. And so he wanted to find a way to, a way to speed that process up. And so using the new, or the relatively new X-ray technology of the time, he developed a device that would allow him to look at soldiers' feet without them even having to take their boots off. So the soldier would come up, he would put his, his booted foot uh, on this device. Dr. Lowe would look through a viewport and believe that he could diagnose the soldier's problem and then get him on his way for treatment. And whether or not this actually worked is, is unknown. I haven't found any research to suggest that this was, that, this, that Dr. Lowe's endeavor was successful. Uh, after all, he was just looking at soldiers' feet in two dimensions as opposed to three, but uh, maybe he was able to draw some conclusions about a soldier's problem by looking at an x-ray of their foot through their boot. But regardless, uh, after the war, Dr. Lowe took this technology that he had developed and decided he wanted to try and apply it to the sale of shoes in the United States. And so in 1920, a device similar to the one that we're looking at here was presented to the, the uh, Shoe Retailers of America convention in Boston. And it was touted as a way to ensure shoe salesmen could get customers to purchase the shoe that they suggested because um, being able to see an x-ray of your foot inside of the shoe that was being recommended was a way to point out the, the, the high points and the low points of, of what the shoe salesman was trying to sell. Well, by the 1920s, these, were started, these devices were starting to show up in uh, shoe stores across the United States. And again, by the 1950s, it's estimated that about 10,000 shoe stores across the United States had this device in them. So what is a shoe fitting fluoroscope? I've already told you that it, it involves x-rays, but in the case of a fluoroscope, fluoroscopes are different from x-ray machines. Uh, they still operate on roughly the same principle, but with a fluoroscope, you don't end up getting a snapshot of x-rays passing through a certain part of your body in time. With a fluoroscope, you can actually stick, let's say that we're taking a fluoroscope of your hand, you can 
you can actually move your hand while it's being bombarded by x-rays with a fluoroscope and you can see your finger bones moving um, during the process. And so this shoe fitting fluoroscope allowed customers to put on the shoe that they were thinking about buying. And again, they would come up to the shoe fitting fluoroscope and they would stand up on this little black platform, grab onto this handle, and then they would stick their foot here into this, this hole right here. The device would be turned on and your foot would be bombarded by x-rays. And by looking through these viewports, you could see how the shoe was attached to your foot. Um, three different ports, so there's one here for the person who's being, whose foot is being x-rayed. There's one for the shoe salesman over here, and then if there was an interested third party who happened to want to see your bony feet, uh, they could look through the other one. Uh, and I'm assuming that you know, mothers would look through this to see their child's feet, that kind of thing. But um, essentially, that was what the fluoroscope did, was it bombarded your feet with x-rays so that you could get a, a look at how the shoe was wrapped around your foot. So what made the shoe-fitting fluoroscope a dangerous device? Well, I'm going to take a closer look at some of these, these little uh, warning labels attached to the side of the device, and we'll let the, the warning labels speak for the device itself. So if you look here, now this warning label was attached after the fact. This was not original to this device. And I have a feeling that as time went on and people became more and more concerned about harmful exposure to x-rays, warning labels like this were attached to these devices. But anyway, let's give this one just a quick read. Um, warning exposure, repeated exposure to x-ray may be harmful. Fluoroscopic examinations for shoe, footing sh for shoe fitting should be limited to three fittings in one day or no more than a total of 12 in one year. Um, it is prohibited, down here at C, it is prohibited to expose any part of a human body other than the foot inside the shoe. At no time should anyone hold the child's foot to the opening. Salesmen should promptly, properly utilize the three intensities provided for the fitting of men's, women's, and children's shoes. So if you look down over here, sure enough, there is a button for, that you push to uh, regulate the amount of exposure for x-rays going through children's feet, women's feet, and men's feet. And then one interesting thing to me is that if you come down here, there's another warning label that says, warning, overexposure to x-ray is harmful. Customers must not operate this machine. Limit for each customer five fittings per day, yearly not to exceed 20 fittings. So they've got five fittings per day down here, and they've got three fittings per day, per day up here. So that, that's kind of a red flag right there that they can't even get their warning labels straight. So what was the problem with this? Why was this a dangerous device? Why was this, this something that um, eventually people started to actually be concerned about having these in their local shoe stores. Well, again, keep in mind that for about 30 years, these devices were expected to be in shoe stores. Uh, X-rays were the, were the new advance of science, and there was very little understanding of how harmful X-rays could be, even though a lot of the early X-ray pioneers died of some pretty horrible diseases because of their unregulated exposure to X-rays. But after World War II, uh, and a lot of it was, I'm sure, related to the atomic research for the bomb, uh, for the atomic bomb, there was a better understanding of just how dangerous this could be. Now, the, one of the problems was that these devices were essentially unregulated. Uh, really, what you had was a, an x-ray machine sitting in the, in the middle of your shoe store that was, in some cases, the shielding was minimal, if there was any shielding at all, in fact, some studies that were done in the 1940s and the 1950s on these devices showed that x-rays were being tossed, um, tossed quite a, a distance away from the machine itself. Uh, they were not contained within the device. So you, you could find x-rays being thrown out of the machine during use as far as 10, 12 feet in diameter uh, around the, the fluoroscope. 
And you could also find x-rays being thrown not just up uh, to the level of a person's feet, they were going up as high as their pelvis. Some of the, all, all of the devices did try to say, you know, here's the maximum number of wrenches that, that a person should be exposed to, radiation wrenches that a person should be exposed to in the course of, of one fitting. But the problem is, since these were unregulated, there were no technicians who were making regular maintenance checks on these. Uh, some of these machines were throwing as much as 70% more radiation at people than was expected. There's an interesting case of a woman in Great Britain who went to the doctor and had all kinds of skin lesions. She had real problems, especially with her feet and her hands. And the doctors, doctors were perplexed as to what this could possibly be. And finally, after investigating her work history, they found out that she worked in a shoe store. And for 10 years, she had been operating one of these machines. And she said that she had been using this, um, these devices as much as 20 times a day, as many as 20 times a day, including putting her foot into the slot here to show children that it wouldn't hurt. She would reach inside with her hands to adjust children's feet. Uh, so that they could get a, a better view of the child's foot through the, through the um, viewports. And really what she had was radiation burns um, all over her body, or at least all over her hands and all over her own feet. So as time went by, more and more people started to investigate this. And it was finally the state of Pennsylvania in 1957, I believe, that outlawed them entirely. And then most, by 1960, most states had followed suit. Again, there was a lot of radiation that was being thrown at um, not just children, but at adults too, whenever they came in for a shoe fitting. Uh, but you had shoe store workers constantly being bombarded by radiation from these, from these devices. And there were also problems with people not really understanding the dangers of radiation. You would have children come into stores in groups because they wanted to be able to look at their, at, uh, you know, little Tommy's feet. He would come up and stick his foot in there and then everybody would gather around the viewports and they would hit, the, hit Tommy's feet with radiation beams over and over and over again because it was a novel thing to do and nobody really knew, um, knew better the, uh, than to say, you know, Tommy, you need to keep away from that. In fact, one of the later um, how-to sheets that came along with these devices actually mentions children coming in and, and making use of this and causing, and causing problems not only to the machine but also it being dangerous. And they recommended putting a kill switch, no pun intended, um, onto the machine so that uh, only the only authorized personnel could use it. But the problem is there was no real training for the people in the shoe store as to how to deal with an x-ray machine either. Uh, one inter interesting side note, modern day x-ray machines usually pull, I want to say 16 watts, somewhere around 16 to 20 watts uh, to, be, to be functional. These would pull as many as 700. So again, just a, um, a dangerous machine in terms of the amount of radiation that they tossed out into your friendly local, hood, lo local neighborhood um, shoe store. So as I said, this, these were eventually banned by most states by 1960, but by that time, people had largely come to look at them, as I said, as more of a danger. And word had finally gotten out by uh, shoe salesmen themselves that the device was really more of a gimmick than an actual aid to helping get uh, people properly fitted in their shoes. Again, when you're looking at uh, your person, your, your customer's shoes through a fluoroscope, you're getting a two-dimensional image, and that in order to fit a shoe properly, you need, probably need more of a three-dimensional image. But shoe salesmen caught onto that, and there was actually a kind of a backlash about the use of these, especially once the, the understanding that radiation was involved and, it, and that radiation was dangerous. There was kind of a backlash uh, against the use of these machines, and they started to disappear from most stores by around 1960. Um, this particular one, the, the, this particular item, we're lucky to have it because even though there were 10,000 of these in use across the United States for decades, when people found out that they were more of a, a danger than anything else, rather than take them and, and uh, turn them into something else, which was kind of a difficult thing to do, they were just destroyed or they were thrown away. So out of those 10,000 or so, there really aren't that many of them around. But we were lucky to have this one given to us when 
a particular shoe store was having a clean out in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and they called us and said, hey, we've got this really interesting foot x-ray device. Would you be interested in taking it into your collection? And we said, yes, we would. It's a, it's a really interesting piece of, of retail history, not only in, in Wyoming, but also from across the United States. So there you go, a simplex shoe fitting fluoroscope. If you have any questions on this device, feel free to email me or give me a call. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or if you have any recollections of using one of these, we've had a couple of people tell us that they remembered using devices like this. In fact, we had one of our volunteers said that she used this exact device uh, back in the late 1950s, mid to late 1950s, at the shoe store that she went to here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. But if you have any, any stories you'd like to relate regarding these, or if you know somebody, a uh, shoe salesman who worked with these, uh, we would love to get their, their history to add to our file so that when we interpret this on exhibit at some point in the future, we'll be able to better tell the story of its use.